This is what being crazy looks like. And for me, it has always said, this is the pain of madness. The tears, the hurt. The head isn't there, but the head is huge, and then it gets, it's... I don't know, it's very, I... Ooh. This is what being crazy looks like. Sure. Everything is, is, is fighting, is bright, is harsh. It hurts. It's the most baffling of human afflictions, its victims the most abused. Mental illness has been with us since the beginning, yet our ignorance far exceeds our knowledge. We don't know what causes it, and we're still searching for effective ways to treat it. We even have trouble defining it. The line between sanity and insanity is blurred. It's sometimes hard to know where one ends and the other begins. You're supposed to go to church on Sundays or temple on Saturday or whatever. You're supposed to listen for the still, small voice of God, but you sure better not hear it. As a society, we have little tolerance for bizarre behavior. So we build huge institutions and look away. And we delegate to the psychiatrist the task of curing or confining those whom we do not wish to see. But psychiatry itself is under attack. Some within the profession think it is going in the wrong direction. Others, mostly former patients, think it harms more than it helps. Psychiatry hasn't done anything for me but, but give me nightmares for the rest of my life. To most Americans, psychiatry is a couch, a chair, a quiet room, and lots of talk, mostly from the patient. But in reality, psychiatry is much more than that. It's drugs and electric shock treatments and, in rare instances, brain operations to try to correct abnormal behavior. It's also huge institutions, barred windows, restraints, seclusion rooms, locked wards. And underlying all this is a nagging question, what are we trying to treat? What is mental illness? That's uh, something I've been grappling with for the last uh, 14 years. Uh, I don't have the answer to it. I consider myself a student of that matter, and I don't know the answer. Generally speaking, I see mental illness as being unable, not unwilling, but unable to cope with our society. Mental illness is a myth, a fraud, a bad metaphor, an excuse, a rationalization. It's a religious viewpoint held by psychiatrists which says that human troubles are somehow medical in origin and medical in their solution. Now, just how poverty, unemployment, unhappiness, fights between husbands and wives, beatings of children, anxiety, alienation, just how all these problems relate to medicine and relate to illness is never stated. What is mental illness? I don't know. It, uh, it covers everything from people who feel slightly badly getting up in the morning one day to people who have very serious suicidal depression or who are so disorganized by psychosis that they can't function at all. So it covers a wide range of terms and conditions. And I think maybe and some of it's in the patient's eye. If it gets serious enough, it's in society's eye. And it, it's a term, a highly ambiguous and difficult term. There are people who can't function, and for them, the end of the line is a mental institution. There are 495 institutions in the United States, 313 of them run by the states, the others private. At any given time, about 200,000 people are hospitalized. All told, some 10 million Americans have been in mental institutions, and countless millions of others have sought help from various kinds of therapists. This report is about those thought to be so seriously disturbed that drastic and sometimes dangerous treatments are used. Many end up in mental institutions where it is much easier to get in than it is to get out. I originally uh, went to a mental hospital voluntarily. 
and uh, through a series of events, uh, it culminated in, in getting committed because mainly because I was trying to get out of the institution, which I was in which I was supposedly a voluntary patient. They told me that uh, I was too sick to leave. And uh, when I said that uh, it was my right to leave anyway, they told me that it wasn't. And in New York State, they can commit you for 60 days uh, on the signature of two doctors. Uh, you don't have to go to court. And that's two months. That's a long time, especially in a state hospital, which is a pretty grim place. Grim, isolated, lonely. Most state hospitals look like prisons. This one, Napa State Hospital in California, looks like a campus. But once inside, there's no mistaking what it is. The key is the symbol of freedom in a mental institution. Only staff members have keys, and unless you have special privileges, you're confined to the ward. And you're at the mercy of the people who run that ward. In many places, you can't make phone calls. Your mail may be restricted, and visitors are generally few and far between. Mark James was a patient at one such ward at Napa State Hospital after a suicide attempt. When I was taken the ward Q7 and 8. I was taken to a cell, they call them seclusion rooms, and locked in. Fortunately, I was not strapped down onto the bed, as many people are. The lights were left on dim all night long, so it was very difficult to sleep. No one came by all night. I was awake, so I guess I could have rolled over and died in there. No one would have known the difference till the morning. People were put into seclusion, for example, for failure to willingly take medication. Any sort of verbal abuse towards a psychiatric tech could result in a trip down the corridor, as it's called. That trip down the corridor can be the first thing that happens to you. This is a newly admitted patient. The staff is wary. We don't know you right now, so we're going to have to check you out first, all right? The seclusion room is part of every mental hospital. Sometimes it's called the quiet room or the blue room. I was on suicide precautions. You had a choice of either sleeping out in the hall, strapped down to a bed and wrist and waist restraints, which I just thought was horrible, or else sleeping in solitary, where I stayed for seven months. And I never in my life wanted to die so badly as when I was locked in that cell. And I did not know what attitude I was supposed to get to get out of there. I was threatened as supposedly a joke that you will have to live for the rest of your life unless you get off suicide precautions. I never wanted to die so badly as in a as, as you know, a means of getting out of that room. I know that the people who did it to me had the best intentions in the world, but that does not excuse it. Now, if I spent, from age seven to about age 10, I spent at least half the time locked in solitary confinement. And I can remember, you know, looking out through the bars and wondering if I was ever going to see, you know, going to be able to walk around on the outside again, and just like, what you just heard, I, even at that age, I was, I wished that I was dead, you know. And that was supposed to help me, you know. Every few days, the psychiatrist would come in, surrounded by all the staff, and tell me how I needed this. This was part of my treatment. Everything that's done to you in these places is part of your treatment. When you're, I was, I was kept from eating. I was put on bread and water for two or three days at a time. That was part of my therapy. I was torn away from my parents, my foster parents, for months at a time. That was part of my therapy. Every kind of, every conceivable thing that's done to you there is called therapy, and it's presented to people on the outside as therapy, too. And what does that do to your head? You know, you know you're being tortured, but you're being told you're being helped. And not only that, you're being told you better say you're being helped, and you better believe you're being helped, because if you keep saying you're, you're being tortured, if you keep complaining about it, it's a symptom of your illness. So... So you have to say that black is white and war is peace in order for them to stop bothering you. What does that do to your head? I mean, you can't think straight when you're treated like that, the way they pervert the language, you know? 
All of the hospitals complain about a lack of money and personnel. They say they would like to do more, but can't. Individual therapy is practically unknown. Institutional psychiatrists are too busy serving as administrators to see their patients. I distinctly remember sitting outside the door, Dr. Macy's door, for like two hours, because you couldn't get in to see Dr. Macy. You just had to sort of sit there, and if he came out, you could catch him and say, hey, Dr. Macy, you know, so-and-so, I got to see you. And he'd say, yeah, I'll be with you, and he'd disappear again. So what do the patients do? Mark James. Life on the ward basically consisted of a lot of what I facetiously I call TV therapy because that was about the only thing there was to do. People would pace back and forth in the halls. There was actually very little square floor space for the number of people on the ward, and this really added to the atmosphere of tension. People would smoke cigarettes, throw the butts on the floor. For those that didn't have cigarette money, they would pick up the butts and then smoke them down to the last possible amount. Oh, a lot of people just chronically stayed in bed all day. There is one therapy that is used on just about every patient, drug therapy. And like every other psychiatric treatment, how it works and if it works are matters of dispute. The psychiatric drugs were the wonder drugs of the 1950s. Thorazine, the first of the major tranquilizers, was given to several million patients within months of its introduction. Since then, dozens of others have come on the market. There are now drugs for almost every condition. Drugs to tranquilize, even out extreme highs and lows, and drugs to lift you from your depression. The drugs couldn't have come at a better time. Patient populations were rising and the drugs promised to slow that growth. The drug companies were quick to exploit the market. Physicians were bombarded with advertisements, brochures, and other sales devices. The drugs quickly became the preferred method of treatment, but they cure nothing. What they do is ameliorate the symptoms of the illness and hopefully, and, and even theoretically, restore a biochemical balance in the central nervous system. Now, in that sense, it's, it's something like a, a diabetic that receives insulin. You can say, well, I take my insulin every day, and my diabetes is in control. But if you ask me, am I cured of diabetes, I would have to say no. The drugs do seem to lessen the obvious symptoms of some mental illnesses, particularly the hallucinations and illusions of schizophrenia. But they also have serious and sometimes fatal side effects. When I was on Thorazine, I could not read. I could not get past the first word in a paragraph. Now, I had never had this problem before, and I became incredibly worried about being able to read. And I didn't know it was a side effect of the side I don't know, even the word side effect, as if, as if it's something off on the side. It's not. It's, it was the primary effect for me, <laughs> you know, um, that the, the fact that the struggle was to not make me read. I thought it was my own problem. I became terrified that I'd never be able to read again. So it created a new problem, and then I just, you know, began to worry about that. The drugs are intended and do, in fact, subdue you completely because it interferes with your thinking, it makes your body twist and contort, it makes your mouth dry. If you're on Thorazine and several of the other so-called tranquilizers, it affects um, uh, the, uh, your sensitivity to light so that your head, if you're out in the sun or even under bright lights indoors, becomes very, very uh, painful. And um, you ha experience many kinds of sensations that you have no way to explain. You don't know that it's the drugs that is doing it to you. And so you think, ah, oh, I must really be messed up because look what's happening to me. Dr. David Richmond, trained as a psychiatrist and now works in a mental health clinic in Oakland, California. He writes frequently about the drugs in pamphlets and as Dr. Caligari in a newspaper published by former mental patients. One of the major problems with the antipsychotics is that they interfere and disturb muscle function so that people who take antipsychotic drugs end up usually with stiff muscles, with muscles that are rigid, often with shaking or tremors of their muscles. Uh, they can also experience what's called dystonic reactions where all of a sudden their muscles go into spasm. And that can also happen with the muscles of your eyes and all of a sudden you're looking up through the top of the ceiling and it's very painful and you can't control it. 
And there are also muscle reactions called dyskinesias, where you get these weird wreathing movements and squirming movements that you can't control. You have an inability to sit still, and you're constantly moving up and going down. And all this is drug-induced. And it's often called schizophrenia, or seen as a part of some person's mental illness, when, in fact, the person is experiencing a drug reaction. And the number of times that I've seen people experiencing drug reactions that has been labeled as craziness is sad. Short of death, the most serious side effect of the drug is a condition called tardive dyskinesia. There is no known cure for it. Joseph Blunt is one of its victims. His ward psychiatrist at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. is Dr. E. Fuller Torre. Uh, Mr. Blount has virtually no signs of his original illness now. The signs that uh, the movements of his mouth are completely side effects of the drugs that he was on for 20 years. Uh, Mr. Blount is quite rational. He understands what's going on. Um, and if you're patient, he can carry on a very rational conversation with you. The movements that he makes with his mouth and with his tongue, he can't stop. They're involuntary movements. He can slow them down by concentrating on them, but as soon as he stops concentrating on them, uh, then they come back and, and are more. Mr. Blount also has some movements of his diaphragm. When the diaphragm contracts, then it causes him to make sounds out of his mouth. Uh, but that's all part of the same condition. If it, if it was not for the side effects of the drugs, uh, Mr. Blount would, uh, in all probability, be able to leave the hospital, at least to live in a foster home. Few new patients in mental hospitals are aware of the side effects of the drugs. They are rarely consulted about the treatments they get. With the drugs, it's a matter of taking them voluntarily or having them forced on you. I had learned, because <clears throat> I had been hospitalized twice before, not to fight medication because I had, in a, a county hospital and in a private hospital, I had been strapped down once to a chair and several times to beds with legs and arms. And I once tried to move my arms and it tightened the leather around my middle so I couldn't breathe and I'm asthmatic and it didn't help any. That's when I thought I was gonna die. So I didn't fight medication. I just, you know, I was cowed like an animal that's beaten. I was afraid. So I let them do whatever trip they decided to do on me. And by and large, you can't make people take them. It becomes a form of moral suasion. And, uh, you know, do people have a right to be crazy? All right. Do uh, people have a right to be crazy? Uh, well, I suppose people have a right to be crazy as long as they can function. Do they have a right to be hospitalized at the expense of other, other citizens when they could be gotten better if they took drugs? That's a, it's a, it's a, I don't know the answer, really. Now, I think the general reasoning there has been that if a person is uh, psychotic to the point that they are misinterpreting uh, reality, that uh, then, then the individual is not really able to make uh, an informed judgment. Now, this, this applies not only to treatment. This implies to uh, making a will, making a contract, uh, uh, getting married, giving testimony, participating in your own defense. Uh, so I think that that is the instance in, in which, in which uh, it, it may be reasonable to, uh, to ins uh, insist that the treatment be, be carried out. Once you uh, legally allow someone to force a chemical like Thorazine or Prolixin into someone else's body, then you open up a Pandora's box of abuses of people that unfortunately is the, the reality that I experienced in virtually every psychiatric ward I ever spent time on. Researchers are just now beginning to learn something about the drugs and their side effects, and it's clear that dosage levels have to be tailored to individual patients. Some drugs can affect the kidneys or the heart, and sudden deaths because of a previous ailment have happened. But psychiatrists, though physicians, are more concerned with their patients' emotional well-being than their physical well-being, and the necessary tests for tolerance are rarely given. The drugs are medicine, but is mental illness a disease? Most psychiatrists think so, but many others don't. The believers say that there is a biological or genetic basis to mental illness, and that there's a cure out there somewhere. They just haven't discovered it yet. Such an approach also assumes that a psychiatrist must be a doctor, because only doctors can treat an illness. It's, it's my belief 
which I think I can justify, that in schizophrenia and the affective disorder, there, there is uh, quite compelling evidence that defects in the mind, in the brain, do exist, and that the brain is not the same as that of a person who doesn't show these phenomena. You know, illnesses are basically something which can be diagnosed by physicians where they're reliable tests which can be utilized to determine the nature of a problem and then some sort of rational treatment can be instituted and, and then you can follow the success or failure of the treatment by some sort of standardized means. None of that really holds true when you try to carry this over into psychiatry and analogize uh, from a medical model into uh, emotional problems. Now, I would prefer to use terms like emotional problems, uh, emotional distress, mental distress, but to stay away from the term illness or disease because there aren't any tests that people can agree upon as how to decide what it is. Uh, it's the sort of thing that distress seems to come and go, whereas illnesses, you know, they're either diagnosable or they're not. And I think the concept of illness and disease in psychiatry has led us down the path to some very, very severe abuses. Despite the uncertainties about whether madness is an organic disease or a reaction to the problems of living, psychiatrists feel they have to do something to relieve human misery. Drugs are one kind of treatment, electric shock and psychosurgery are others. <laughs>